just a treat to be back again. So um, I will take a couple minutes to introduce myself. Uh, first of all, it's nice to see a couple of familiar faces in the audience. So um, I am uh, with Whole Foods Market. My title is really Ecozar and Regional Forager, just like it says on the board there. Um, I've been with Whole Foods Market now for 17 years. Actually, just had my anniversary last uh, month uh, for 17 years. And it's been quite a ride, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But I did promise Gordon that I would say a little bit about my title of Ecozar, which, um, well, I did not start out as the Ecozar at Whole Foods Market. I started out, uh, I came into the company from a completely different field. I was in healthcare and uh, hospital administration for a long time uh, before I made the career switch to Whole Foods Market into retail. And um, I did that for a variety of reasons, one of which is that my hospital was uh, closing and they were uh, downsizing. And so I took the opportunity to do something that I uh, toyed with doing for a very long time, which is getting back into retail. Because I grew up in retail and I really love that environment and you know, have always just loved being a, a person who works in retail. So it was a great opportunity 17 years ago to just completely hop out of um, social work, hospital administration, and into uh, Whole Foods Market. So when I joined the company, I went into uh, leadership. And for the first eight years I was with the company, I basically ran a couple of our stores in the Boston area. And then about 10 years ago, um, the leadership team in the North Atlantic region, which is New England, basically said, you know, we uh, have this core value that we talk about a lot, which is caring for our communities and the environment. It's our fifth core value. Um, fact is, we don't do a very good job with that, and we need to start doing a good job with it. So the decision was made at that point in time to create and dedicate a position to taking care of the environment. Um, I thought I would be competing with a whole bunch of my friends and colleagues for that job, and it turned out I was the only one who uh, applied for it. So. It was uh, disappointing and fortuitous for me at the same time. So um, when it came time to decide what we were going to call me, I decided that you know what the company really needed was an Ecozar. And I uh, said, that's my title. That's what I'm going to be. Um, we had a little back and forth about that. My direct boss, who was the president of the North Atlantic region, said, no, you're not going to be the Ecozar. And I said, well, yeah, I am. And um, he said, OK, I'll give you a choice. You can have either the title or a salary. I took the title. Um, our CEO, who hopefully some of you have read about, is quite a character. His name is John Mackey, CEO and founder of Whole Foods Market. He hates my title. Uh, and he says, you know, Lee, uh, Azar has absolute power, and you have absolutely none. <laughs> and I say, that's true, John. That's very true. But that forces me to be really strategic to get th things done. And so for the last uh, 11 years or so, I've been playing at that, I've been very strategic because I've been doing things that really needed to get done. Uh, and in our industry, they weren't always the top priority for people. Things like um, pushing towards zero waste. Um, we're a grocery chain. You know, we, we're there to sell food to people. And, that, and I think we do a really good job with that. Um, you know, diverting waste is not the number one priority for everybody, although it's a very important goal for everybody. But uh, I get to be the one that kind of stewards that and shepherds it along. Um, and so it's an honor, and it's also uh, the title is a good way to open doors and get people to laugh a little bit and lighten up. So that's the answer, Gordon. That's where Ecozar fits in. I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, about getting to zero waste in the retail food environment. Uh, I am going to try to focus as much as I possibly can on what happens in our world uh, in the produce department. and. Um, it's easy for me to do because that's where I started with Whole Foods Market. When I first joined the company, I came in as a produce team leader. And um, I didn't really know where else to get involved. And I needed to get started somewhere. So I was asked, well, what part, you know, what department of Whole Foods Market do you feel most comfortable in? And I, you know, having come from an agricultural community and feeling really connected to farmers and, and to agriculture and to produce in general, I said, I think the produce department is where I should start. My first day on the job, I started to see how much um, food waste was being thrown away in the produce department, and it shocked me. 
And uh, I saw that happening for a while and started to think about it. And schemer that I am, I said, well, you know, all this stuff is being thrown away. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gardener. I'm into agriculture, so why don't I figure out a way to drive around and collect all this stuff and, you know, take it somewhere and uh, turn it into compost and sell it. So that was my first scheme. I didn't actually do that, but uh, I thought it was a good idea and there's possibilities there. Anyway, here's the food recovery hierarchy uh, from the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Has anybody seen this before? It's been out for a little while now. So I'll just walk you through it really quickly. Uh, at the very top of the hierarchy, you see source reduction, reducing the volume of surplus food generated. Uh, next down is feeding hungry people, donating extra food to food banks, soup kitchens, and shelters. And then you go to feeding animals, diverting food scraps to animal feed. Fourth down, industrial uses such as providing waste oils for rendering and fuel conversion, and food scraps for digestion to recover energy. Down near the bottom, you get to composting. Well, I happen to think that's a pretty important thing to be doing, but I also agree that there are a whole lot of other more important things to do with food waste before you get to that point. And I'm going to talk about that as well. And then at the very bottom, one that we all need to avoid at all possible cost is to allow food or any organic material to get into a landfill for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, we can't afford to waste it, uh, no matter if it's scraps or otherwise, and we can't afford to bury it in the ground because it becomes methane gas. And methane gas is the most potent greenhouse gas there is. So really, at all costs, we need to be avoiding letting food get into a landfill, or an incinerator for that matter. Here's my goals for the evening. I hope they're going to be yours as well. Uh, I want to ask more questions of you guys than I really have answers for. I hope you'll do the same thing. Uh, this is a process of, you know, taking a look at what we're doing and finding better ways to do it and smarter ways to do it. Um, really, I want to get us all pissed off about what the situation is with food waste. What are we doing wasting food? Uh, we should be asking ourselves that. A third of the food that's produced on this planet is wasted, thrown away. That's a crime. I want to introduce the concept of waste as food. Um, I want to begin to erase from all of our minds the concept of waste altogether. That's a word that we need to eliminate from our vocabulary. I, I've done a pretty good job of that myself, and I really encourage you guys to be thinking about that as well. There's no such thing as waste. Everything that's waste is food for something else. Um, and I also want to remind us that there's no such thing as a way. Anybody here familiar with Barry Commoner? Gordon, yes? Um, so Barry Commoner was a personal hero of mine. Uh, on the first Earth Day, he came to my college and he uh, gave a talk, and that's the first time that I ever heard his four or five uh, rules of ecology, depending on how you count. But one of those was this concept that there's no such thing as a way. Um, we really have to get rid of the idea that you can throw something somewhere and it's going to go away. It doesn't. It's still there. We still need to deal with it. So uh, that's another concept I'd like you guys to be thinking about particularly when you leave here tonight, you're not throwing anything away. It just doesn't happen. What's the scope of the problem with food waste? Um, in the UK, retailers and wholesalers produce about 1.7 million tons of food waste a year. In the US, supermarkets, restaurants, and convenience stores are throwing away about 27 million tons of food annually. The dollar amount is significant, but for me, that's not the biggest story. The biggest story is the tonnage, but $41.9 billion a year in uh, the U.S. alone. And on top of this, and that's just, again, that's just supermarkets, uh, retailers, restaurants, convenience stores. Then we get to what consumers waste. And in the U.S. alone, consumers waste an additional almost uh, 26 million tons of food annually. Um, when you think about those numbers, uh, for me, one of the things that's really important to pay attention to is the argument out there, particularly by those who are pushing the uh, GMO issue pretty hard, that you know the reason to genetically modify food is because we don't have enough food, we need more production, we need to really expand production. Um, to me, that's insane. I mean, there's plenty of food being produced to feed the world. The problem is getting it to where it needs to be. Distri distribution is a key part of this. 
So, uh, food waste is a global phenomenon and impacts the environment and society in these four key areas. There's the energy used to produce the food. You know, lots of different ways that energy is used. Uh, the equipment, the uh, fuel that's involved, the, um, you know, all the different inputs that go into raising food. Uh, then there's the food that's disposed of by retailers, the food that's wasted in households, and the energy that's used to dispose of the food waste. You know, trucking food waste, uh, burying it, burning it, um, all the environmental hazards. I spoke about methane gas production. Um, that's just one of them. Um, <coughs> for landfilling food waste. So there are, you know, so many different reasons why we really need to address this problem fairly aggressively. And by the way, I am comfortable. I know we'll have a Q&A time afterwards, but I am comfortable if anybody wants to stop me, just throw your hand up if you need more, you know, if you need me to highlight anything here or expand on it. Yes? Landfill? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't so hear. I wonder, how would you get this price? Actually? Where did that, those numbers come from? Yeah. Um, these are all, uh, you know, publicly available. I mean, you can, you can uh, go to any of the sites. In fact, I, I can give you some links after the presentation uh, to where this information is available. Is the 41.9 billion calculated as if the food hadn't gone to waste after it was sold for yeah. on the shop? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I think it's more the former, yeah, yeah. It's the amount of food that, you know, represents in sales on the shelf. Okay. Okay, so, and again, globally one-third of all food produced is wasted in processing, handling, storage, sale, preparation, and serving of the food. Again, are we getting pissed off yet? Uh, I do pretty much every time I see this. I'm going to focus tonight on what we at Whole Foods Market are trying to do about this situation. Um, I think we're in some ways um, representative of the food, uh, the retail food business, but uh, I think we may be ahead of the curve in certain areas, so I'll try to highlight those for you as well. I do want to put something in context, though. Whole Foods Market is a very, very small company. In our industry, you know, we have 344 stores as of this evening worldwide, which means we have, you know, a bunch in the United States. We have some in Canada and we have a handful in the United Kingdom. Um, but compared to, say, Stop and Shop, which has over 2,000 stores, and, you know, the parent company, Ahold, has, I think, 30,000 or so stores globally, you know, we're a real tiny operator. At the same time, we have a lot of influence in this industry, and I think we have a, a pretty strong halo effect, so we try to leverage that as much as we possibly can to provide examples of, of things that we're trying to move along. Um, so again, one of the, you know, the, the halo effect works well for us, and people do pay attention to us and see us as leaders in, in a number of fields. Uh, when it comes to purchasing clout, we haven't got much. And when it, what it takes to shift an entire industry is often the scale of a stop and shop or even larger. So uh, Walmart is a perfect example of this, you know, the kind of company that has such an incredible, powerful footprint that they can get things done that often small players like us can't unless we do it in collaboration. So that's another idea that I want to plant tonight. We can talk about that more later. But collaborating within our industry is one way to really make some change happen. Okay, so um, here's one of the things that we try to do, and this is really at the very beginning of our supply chain, which is we, we try to concentrate on quality uh, to the deepest extent we possibly can. Um, so uh, that's our number one focus in the produce world at all levels across the company. Our number one core value, it's not in terms of importance, but the way we list them in our, in our business, our number one core value is selling the highest quality food that we can possibly get our hands on. Um, and that really does drive the bus for us. Uh, you know, we, we try not to put anything on our shelves that's really not the highest quality. Um, quality in our market is determined by taste. Uh, the best way to determine that is to try it. 
uh, appearance and condition, uh, freshness, um, traceability, knowing where and how the product was grown, which allows us to inform our customers. <coughs> uh, and some examples again, organic, whole trade, and local, those are very important qualities for our customers uh, in terms of our food. And then the USDA uh, grade standards and specifications, um, which specify things such as color, size, and form. Now, how many of you have been to a Whole Foods Market, to a store? Anybody who hasn't been? Most of you have been. So you know when you walk into our stores, we put our produce departments right up in front of the store. That's the, usually the first department that you walk into. And we put a lot of effort, and I'm sure you'll know this and you'll recognize it, we put a lot of effort onto making those pop, making them really stand out and wow you. So, um, you know, they're big displays, they're very abundant displays, they're, you know, the top quality. Every single person in Whole Foods Market in the company is empowered to go to a display and take off a product that doesn't meet the highest quality standards. That's an expectation for everybody who works in our business, that if you see something that's not top quality, it can't be on the shelf. Now, in my mind, um, I can defend that and I can argue that in terms of sales because our customers are very particular about what they buy and that's what they're looking for. You'll, you, you'll see if you come into the store that people will root around through the displays looking for the perfect tomato, the perfect peach, you know, the perfect pear, and um, they'll leave the ones behind that they don't think are that perfect example. So, you know, we want to provide that for them at the same time. Um, that involves a lot of handling, it involves a lot of bruising, and product does get uh, damaged in that process. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that beautiful apple display, you know, Mrs. McGillicuddy comes in and she takes the bottom apple and the, the whole thing ends up on the floor. That's a whole display of apples that's pretty much not for sale anymore. Um, so, you know, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Uh, we sell a lot of beautiful produce and there's a lot that's left behind because it, you know, it ends up not meeting that top quality standard. Now, when I say left behind, I don't mean wasted and I'll talk more about that. So, before it ever gets to us, at the very beginning of the supply chain, we have a field team that's out in the fields with the growers. It's a fairly extensive team. This is uh, seven of our uh, crew. It's not the entire crew, but we have people who are actively out in the fields with the growers day in and day out all over the world. And their job is to, um, you know, really inspect for quality. Um, so here's what they're looking for when they're out in the field. These are the key components of what we call Whole Foods produce, uh, produce inspection. They're looking at size. They're looking at the sugar content, which is called bricks. Don't know what that stands for. Maybe somebody in here does. I can't remember, but anyway, that, that's the term that's used for sugar density. Uh, they're looking for the pressure inside of the, the fruit or vegetable, the temperature. Uh, they're looking for the uh, cut and the taste internally. They're looking for how it looks externally. Uh, they're going by color and they're going by weight. There are a couple of other things that they're looking for as well, but all of that together goes into quality control. So on our end, we're not purchasing produce unless it meets all of these standards. And you know, they have fairly rigorous standards for, for all of these different um, you know, uh, variables in the inspection. The other thing that they're looking for, by the way, and I didn't uh, put a slide up about this, but they're looking uh, very carefully at what the um, social um, considerations are, you know, the well-being of the growers, what the field conditions are for the growers, how they're being treated, you know, what their living conditions are, the sanitation conditions, um, you know, educational opportunities for their children. All those things are very important part of, uh, a very important part of what we look for when we're out in the fields. Um, don't necessarily specifically speak to quality, but that's part of our inspection as well. So, coming back into the store level, this is an initiative that we started uh, just this past September because we were looking at, in the North Atlantic region, again, NA stands for North Atlantic, and that's New England. We have 28 stores and four facilities here in New England. Um, Shrink is waste, basically. That's the word that we use for whatever doesn't get sold that you know, comes into our stores as product uh, and goes out the back door uh, not for sale, not for donation, not for uh, sampling or demoing, but just as pure waste. 
Um, so we uh, really wanted to get a handle on shrink uh, across the board, not just in produce. And this past uh, September, we put into place a shrink a reduction initiative. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So our goal was to reduce shrink by nine basis points across the region. Uh, total regional shrink, uh, nine basis points. Um, a huge portion of total shrink for us comes from spoilage. So uh, again, these are confidential figures. I'm going to show them to you. But um, if you would, please don't broadcast these outside of the room. Um, so we have about $300 million a year in sales. Shrink is 6.64% of that. Uh, or about almost uh, $20,000, $19.8,000 uh, in, I mean, yeah. Million. 19 million, sorry. $856,000 in shrink in a year. So our target was to get down to um, our combined spoilage across the, whole com uh, across the whole region would be a 50 basis point reduction to save uh, $1.5 million. So, that's the number that you see down at the bottom. That's our target. Here are the areas that we're targeting, trying to reduce shrink. Again, shrink being spoilage, waste. So at the top, you'll see uh, it's a little hard to read in yellow. It says cull and product rework program. That's the biggest piece of what our shrink reduction initiative is about. Um, and what we're trying to do is um, reduce by a million dollars just in that area alone. So per fiscal period, we have 13 fiscal periods a year. That would be about 76, almost $77,000 per fiscal period. Uh, per store, per fiscal period would be about $2,700, $2,800 per store each fiscal period. That's what our goal has been. Okay. Um, these other categories, merchandising and operations, uh, team buying, loss reporting, and inventory and receiving procedures, all make a contribution, but you can see it's a much smaller contribution than that million dollar contribution from a call program. Uh, I will say, though, the team buying, I want to talk about that for just a minute. We're very careful at Whole Foods Market about the way we buy the, the food, the, you know, the food that we bring in for sale. So I think we're more rigorous ab about that than maybe uh, other grocers are, other supermarkets are. We buy very tight as much as we possibly can. So even though, you know, again, you walk into the store, you see this produce department, you know, pile it high and watch it fly. Anybody ever heard that term before? That's one that we use within the business. You know, the idea that that's really what customers are wowed by. They, they see these huge, beautiful piled displays and, you know, they're so impressed by that that they fill up their grocery cart with it and, you know, take it away. And for the most part, that's really true. That's, that is what people like to see and what they expect from us. Um, but there's, again, there's all that obvious, um, you know, shrink potential from doing it that way. So I want to give you one example. Our southern Pacific region, which is the L.A. area, Orange County, down in that part of the country, a few years back, they wanted to find out a little bit more about how much they were throwing away from the produce department. So they started to do what's called uh, waste audits, which basically is dumpster diving. You take your compost dumpster, you empty it out on the ground, you rake through it, you put it in, you know, put it in different piles and you categorize it. And one of the things they learned from that is they were throwing away an enormous amount of bananas. Bananas are, by the way, the, one of the two uh, top items that we sell in Whole Foods Market, water being the other, believe it or not. So um, what the Southern Pacific region found by doing that waste audit is that they were throwing away uh, in the region about $100,000 worth of bananas a fiscal period. Now, that's an awful lot of bananas. Bananas are pretty inexpensive. So $100,000 per fiscal period in bananas alone. The other drawback to that, I see your hand, I'll get to you in one second. Um, the other drawback to that is that Bananas, unlike many other produce items, there's not a whole lot else you can do with them. You know, when it comes to trying to find other uses for them, there's only so much banana bread you can make. And other than that, there's not a whole lot left, banana muffins. So, um, so what they learned from that process is that they could cut back on their purchases of bananas by about $100,000 a fiscal period, end up saving, you know, millions of dollars just by doing that. Go ahead in the back. Yeah, you, you blew 
blew my mind with the water and bananas thing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, is that a dollar amount of sales, or is that a unit? It's dollars. It's, uh, yeah, it's a dollar Profit amount of sales. Or revenue or? Yeah. Believe okay. it or not, huge. Um, so we're, we're determined to take a, a million dollars of waste away in um, call and product reworking. Uh, let me see if my next slide explains that. If not, I'll go into it. Yeah, so calls and rework. Why are we focusing on this? Um, obviously, it's going to reduce waste in the waste stream. It's going to improve quality on the sales floor, help our team members focus on a quality presentation. Um, let me say a little bit more about this. So culling is basically the process of taking any product from those displays that I talked about earlier, you know, those beautiful, big, abundant, piled up displays, any product that's there that doesn't meet the highest quality uh, standard, you know, that's bruised or damaged in some way or is something that our customers are not going to buy, uh, taking it out of those displays, if we can, if we can possibly rework it doing that or if not, getting that to a different department that can use it rather than wasting it. So reworking, uh, if you, anybody in here ever worked in a produce department? At all? Yes? So uh, you know that one of the things you do with greens is you can refresh them. Uh, you know, when they're out on a display and they start to look, look a little limp and a little worn, that doesn't mean that they're wasted. It means that if you trim the bottom and put them back in water, they come back to life again. So that's one example of reworking where you can actually get a couple of days of extra shelf life sometimes, certain products just by doing that. Uh, just by trimming off the base. You know that with flowers, you know, when you buy a fresh bunch of flowers and then you take it home, you cut off an inch or so of the bottom of the stems, put it in water after a couple of days. If you do that again, you can extend the life of the flowers. Same kind of principle. So, you know, we try to, again, we try to rework as much food as we possibly can by doing that and we try to cull as much as we can. And uh, keeping the focus for our team members on that, you know, we want the top quality, we want the highest quality product on our shelves that we can possibly have. That doesn't mean that the other stuff is not perfectly edible uh, and perfectly fine. It, again, mostly is a sales driven kind of a variable, which means that our customers probably won't buy it if it doesn't meet their standards. But again, it doesn't have anything to do with whether it's tasty or edible or any of that stuff or safe to eat. Yeah. It's a great uh, question and um, I don't have a number or a statistic to apply to it, but I do know that um, we believe that our, our and we, we show this and we um, talk to our customers and our team members about it, that the, you know, the product that we go through and rework and, and you know, maintain that quality standard lasts longer at home for the customer. So in a lot of the traditional or the uh, conventional supermarkets, if you buy a head of lettuce, for example, you know, you take it home and in a day or so, it, there's not much there left to work with. Um, we see that we get longer shelf life and longer uh, keeping time at home. So um, I think that's where the difference is. I think we put a lot more into taking care of it on the shelf so that, you know, it just has longer legs when it gets home. Um, so uh, let me go back to this. How are we going to do this call program? So the best way for us to do almost anything in Whole Foods Market is to talk to the people who have their hands on it every day. So when we started the call program, we went to our team members on the floor and we talked to them about, um, you know, what's the best possible practice for getting this food safely from the display shelf to another department so that, you know, it can, somebody else can use it, somebody else can work with it. Um, and then we set up processes based on what they told us. Um, we really do believe that our team members are the experts at this and you know we really need to go by what's going to work for them. Operationally if it doesn't work for them, if it's going to take them a lot more time to get this done, uh, if it's going to slow them down in getting their work done, it's probably not going to work. So the best way to put anything into practice for us is really to go by our team members' wisdom and, and, and really you know try to respect that as much as we can. And then again, to set up these processes to get the product reworked as quickly as we can. 
Transfer or no transfer? This was a biggie for us. Uh, traditionally, um, when we uh, did this, and we've always done this, uh, you know, this call process uh, to some extent, uh, not in as focused a way as we're doing it now. Uh, but when we did it, we didn't apply any value to it from department to department. It was just kind of a giveaway. So, for example, if food was being transferred from produce to our prepared foods department, the expectation was there wouldn't be any economic value to that at all. There wouldn't be any, you know, financial value. It would just go from one department to another. It would be considered free food basically for prepared foods. It would help them with their margins, but it wouldn't do anything for the produce team. We didn't really feel like that was going to be the right kind of incentive base for all the teams to participate in this uh, and put the work and energy into making it happen. So what we decided to do again is to set up a, well, again, we got feedback from all of our teams, all of our product coordinators, and our product coordinators run their departments within our region. So there's a produce coordinator, a prepared foods coordinator, a bakery coordinator, a meat coordinator. They oversee all the different teams in our stores, you know, under that, uh, that umbrella. So we talked to all those people. We decided to set up a structured cost so that the specific items or specific categories would have some economic value involved. So for example, in the seafood department, um, the seafood team would get three fifty dollars a pound for any items that ended up in the hot bar. Again, if you go into our stores, you know, you'll find these, you know, ready-to-eat hot foods. Uh, you'll often find a fish item, a seafood item in there. So, um, you know, three fifty dollars a pound is what the seafood team gets from the prepared foods team for that, for those items. If it's going to go in the chef's case, which is a couple of steps up from the hot bar, that's really, you know, the, the focal point of our prepared foods department. That's where all that beautiful, you know, restaurant quality food lives. Um, if the quality of the uh, food, you know, and, and the value of the food uh, translated to that case, then uh, they would be getting $5 a pound for those items. Ground beef from the meat department uh, across the board, that was going to be two fifty dollars a pound that, uh, you know, would go to the meat team if it's going to prepared food. So just a few examples of that. But again, we wanted to have a financial incentive in there for the teams to, to do this as well. Uh, and then we established some structured procedures for how this was going to ha be handled in between all the different departments. Uh, made sure that all the team members knew how it worked, posted signs about it, instructions, trained them for this so that everybody was pretty much on board with it. And this is an ongoing process, by the way. Uh, again, we just started in September, so we're still rolling this out to some extent. We're still tweaking it, but it's pretty much in place across the board now. Uh, this was one of the uh, solutions that, uh, again, listening to our team members, how can we make this work for you guys that may, that's going to give it the best possible shot at success? So we created a call cart program. So every store has, uh, and every produce department and prepared foods department has a set of these uh, carts, call carts. They've got uh, six bins, six bins, seven bins, uh, seven bins in them. They're all clearly labeled. Uh, the card is clean, it's organized, it's easy to use, and it's labeled in three different languages, English, Spanish, and Portuguese, which is the, you know, the vast majority of the languages that our team members speak. So pretty much everybody gets it. Um, these are, um, these, are uh, these again are in each of our produce departments on wheels so that they can go from produce to prepared foods and back. Um, we have a call board that's hung in the back of the house that's updated daily for everybody to see. We have dedicated one of our associate store team leaders to follow up on the call board daily, so there's accountability built into this thing. The as associate store team leader is the assistant store manager. So at that level, that's the person who's responsible to make sure that this program is working in their store. Um, we measure the quantity of the calls that are available and we set targets by, uh, for each store. Um, prepared Foods has a rework master recipe list that they establish. So they basically say, here's our menu for today. Here's what we're preparing. What do you guys have available that, that will fit into that menu? What items can we get from you? You know, peppers, onions, uh, radishes, whatever it happens to be that fits into the menu that we have for the day. Um, we have a rework expert on each prepared foods team. So that person, again, is, is the designated person who figures all this stuff out from the prepared food side and decides what's needed and how much of it is needed. And then we have a daily meeting between 
um, the produce buyer and our prepared food chef uh, to synchronize the use of the calls so that again on the purchasing side the produce people are bringing in enough for their displays and enough for their sales and they're factoring in it's part of the equation how much is going to end up going to prepared foods Justin No, and that's a really good question. It's something I'll look into. What's your What's your assumption about that? Um, I would assume that the package stuff would stay better. I'm not sure. It might. It might have some additional protection from the package, but the package is not going to be all that substantial. Um, usually, if it's in a package, if we're doing that ourselves, it's already been reworked once. Um, so. One example of that would be our value-added uh, product. Does everybody know, you know, we basically in our stores we have uh, vegetables and fruits that have already been prepped, like salad bar stuff or mm -hmm. stuff that um, you know is kind of take-home convenience food. So you know, we'll chop peppers, we'll chop onions, we'll package those so people can take them home. Because it's been worked so much already, I'm not sure it would have the same legs as fresh. I would guess it wouldn't have as much legs as fresh uh, onions or peppers would. Yeah. No, it's a really good question, and I don't, I don't know the answer. I'll try to find out, though. Okay. So uh, everybody, kind of with me as far as we've gotten here. <clears throat> and this is a biggie. Uh, we assign accountability, so we make sure that there's one go-to person in every store that's our shrink captain. That's different from the associate store team leader. That's you know, they're just kind of overseeing the process, but <clears throat> at the end of the day, we want one person to go to and make sure that they are working with this every day, that everybody knows their role, everybody knows what the responsibilities are and the expectations are, and that this program is being worked. So this is each of our 28 stores, and that's the person who's been assigned to be the shrink captain for each store. So that's just one example of what we're trying to do about this food waste program. Again, our target is to reduce waste by a million dollars a year just by this alone. Um, it's too soon to tell how we're doing with that. Uh, we have some initial anecdotal evidence that goes up and down. Doesn't surprise me, depending on the store, depending on the department, you know, how well people are working the program. But it's really been designed to work. Um, so I think it's more human variability than it is the system that we've put in place. We, uh, we really believe in feeding people. That's, you know, that's a huge part of what our mission is. So, you know, we're a company that's here to feed people. That's, uh, you know, that's an incredibly important part of our mission. And to try to feed people healthy food, that's the other part of it. You know, there are a lot of companies that are feeding people, but really Whole Foods Market is, is dedicated to try and to, and, you know, help people learn how to eat healthier, uh, more nutritious food and have, you know, a, a healthier life because of that. So um, whatever we can't sell, uh, either by selling directly off the shelf or by transferring to another department to be reworked into something different, either prepared foods or bakery or whatever, um, then we want to give it away. And we have a very aggressive program for getting as much edible food as we possibly can to food banks. Um, every day, every store has a food bank donation. Um, that tends to be a lot of baked goods. Uh, food banks are pretty liberal about taking baked goods. Um, it's fresh produce. It's uh, grocery items like canned food. Um, what food banks are reluctant to take from us are prepared foods. Um, they're really kind of leery about that for a number of different reasons because they don't feel like they can manage it, you know, safely to get it from our store to the uh, folks who need to eat it. It's just, you know, you've already cut down significantly on the, on the shelf life when you um, cook food. So again, we try to donate as much as we possibly can. Um, and um, that varies, again, by store, by community, what food banks are available. We sometimes deliver, but that's pretty challenging to do. So mostly we rely on food banks to be able to come and pick up as much as we possibly can. Um, we are determined by the end of this calendar year to have metrics for every single one of our stores in terms of how much they're donating to food banks, but 
uh, just for an example, in 2010, our six New York City stores donated about 200 tons of food to shelters and food banks. Um, the way the food banks calculate that, that's about 400,000 meals. So it's a pretty significant amount. And again, you know, we really are very determined to try to do as much of that as we possibly can. A um, couple of other ways that we're um, working on the uh, produce side in particular. Um, we've just started a program, literally just started with the Greater Boston Food Bank, um, where our growers, our produce growers, um, well, let me talk about this for a little bit. Um, produce growers uh, have two main streams for their product, one of which is wholesale, well, you know, wholesale or retail, wh whatever, you know, it could be uh, their farm stand, it could be a CSA, it, it could be wholesale, you know, selling to businesses like ours. What they don't um, sell to businesses like ours can go in a couple of different directions. It can go into food production, so maybe they sell it to, you know, people who can the food or uh, cook with the food and uh, package it in some way. Um, or a lot of their food that doesn't meet a uh, high enough quality standard for any of those streams can end up just getting left in the field and passed over as seconds. Usually what happens with that is that it just gets plowed under, um, doesn't get harvested at all. So there's a fairly significant amount of food that's being left in the field by the growers that's perfectly edible, just is not gonna meet the visual or you know, some other standard for getting into one of those other streams. Um, so this new program with the Greater Boston Food Bank involves our picking up those um, seconds, you know, the, the food that's being left in the fields from our growers, um, either from them directly from the fields or from their packing sheds. Once the food gets to the packing shed, and it's been left behind in that process. Again, perfectly edible, perfectly safe, just not meeting those top quality standards, uh, visually more than anything. Um, we're getting that collected and we're getting that brought uh, for donation to the food banks. Now what they do with it, you know, they process the food, they, they freeze it, they can it, they store it, they serve it. Again, people are being fed with this food, it's not going to waste. Uh, we've got a long way to go with this. This is in its infancy stages, but what Whole Foods is doing is, you know, we're, we're working with our growers, we're providing the transportation and we're getting it to the folks who can continue to use it to feed people. Um, we're also talking to our growers about getting some of those seconds directly to our prepared foods teams rather than the food only coming into produce, you know, being uh, sold in produce and then reworked through the cull program. Why not bring those seconds from the fields directly to prepared foods? We're going to use it, we're going to cook it. Again, top quality food, you know, flavor wise it's perfect, it's just, you know, it's not going to be left in the field and plowed under, it's going to come in to feed people. So that's another program that we're developing. Feeding animals, uh, again, uh, you know, in the hierarchy, you saw that on the, um, you know, the food waste hierarchy. Uh, we try to do this as much as we possibly can as well. So uh, just a couple of examples here in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, we have a number of stores that are donating their, you know, their food waste, quote unquote, to local pig farms. Uh, in the Chicago area, um, they are partnering with the Lincoln Park Zoo for meat and produce waste. Uh, by the way, not far from here in Cheshire, Connecticut, we have our uh, central distribution center that serves the North Atlantic and the Northeast regions of Whole Foods. So it's right in between the New York City, New Jersey, uh, and what, uh, Eastern Connecticut stores and our North Atlantic, which are New England stores. Um, we have a huge amount of food that comes into that facility, including our beef program. Um, so any beef that comes in <clears throat> to the distribution center and doesn't uh, qualify, you know, isn't high enough quality to go into our stores is donated to a local zoo. Um, I don't remember which zoo it is, but it's one here in Connecticut somewhere. So these are just a couple of examples. Again, we have stores that have programs with rabbit farmers where they're setting their greens aside every day and that's being, you know, that's going to the rabbits. Um, so again, any opportunity that we have to divert food to uh, animals, we try to do that as well. <coughs> and then technical processes that can use some of that material uh, instead of having it go to waste. So um, our stores all have um, cooking oils 
in fryolators, you know, there's a fairly significant amount of our food that ends up getting cooked. And up until last year, um, a lot of that oil was going to, um, you know, companies that would take it and use it to make uh, various different kinds of products, not necessarily ones you'd want to use. Um, but we were paying to have it removed as a waste product. Again, just want to emphasize this idea that there is really no such thing as waste. What we're doing now in our North Atlantic region is we're collecting all of the cooking oil from all of our stores and from our central commissary, which is a huge kitchen that we have in Everett, Massachusetts. And we've installed a generator, and you see a picture of it there. Uh, this is the first generator of its kind that's being used in the United States, at least. They're doing more of this in the UK. That's running completely from straight cooking oil. It's not, um, it's not being chemically processed into um, you know, a different kind of a fuel. It's a straight cooking oil. Um, and it's powering our entire commissary facility. So uh, we got a lot of really interesting press about this. And again, you know, we used to pay to have this removed as waste. Now it's, uh, it's a great source of power. <coughs> Anaerobic digestion being used a lot in Europe and in other parts of the world. Not so much in this country yet. Basically involves taking food, <coughs> uh, processing it without oxygen. Uh, it's basically composting, but in an, an environment that doesn't have oxygen. And so it um, uses the methane gas, it captures the methane gas, and that's turned into fuel or it's turned into power. And by the way, at the end of the day, there's also a byproduct of compost. So you're getting at least two very valuable streams out of food waste, one of which is power or electricity or fuel, and one of which is uh, compost for agriculture. Again, um, this is an up and coming technology. Uh, we're aware of several different projects uh, locally. In fact, one in Connecticut um, that you know, are in the initial stages of getting funding and getting permitting. Uh, we're hoping that this is going to become a bigger opportunity for, uh, for food waste. Uh, a couple of interesting examples of uh, things that are going on with some other byproducts of food or uh, agricultural waste. <coughs> Uh, the USDA has some really interesting packaging initiatives going on and a couple of examples that I have seen and heard about recently, uh, one of which is using chicken feathers to make packaging, another of which is using fish fins to make packaging. Um, you know, I couldn't begin to explain to you how they do that and what technologies are involved, but that's what the feedstock is for packaging. Um, and then again, there's a fairly significant industry out there already that's making compostable uh, plastics from uh, various food wastes, such as potatoes, sugar beets, sugar cane, things like that. Um, anything that has sugar in it can technically become a plastic. Um, the, the best well-known one is called PLA, polylactic acid. Um, there's a company called um, <clears throat> NatureWorks. You may or may not have seen you know, something about NatureWorks, but they make a lot of clear plastic packaging out of corn. Uh, they have a huge facility out in Iowa, um, right in the middle of the cornfields. Um, <clears throat> we at Whole Foods are not using that material because 90% of the corn that goes into that process is genetically modified corn, and we're pretty clearly out there as not you know, supporting GMO technology, so we don't want to provide a market for that while we're, you know, using that kind of material. But um, again, it can be made out of almost any plant material that contains sugar. So we're waiting for a non-GMO source. And there are some out there already. There's some material coming in from Italy now that's made out of a non-GMO maize that basically does the same thing. So that's pretty exciting technology. <clears throat> and then, last but not least, composting or organics recycling. So um, that's me on the left with one of my good buddies uh, raking through the uh, compost heap. I told you earlier that the best way to figure out you know, what's in your waste stream is to dump it out and rake through it and characterize it, weigh it, you know, put it in piles so you can really get a sense of what's in there. Um, so uh, that's the first step of the process. I tried not to do that in July. It's pretty ugly in July, but it happens sometimes. <clears throat> Again. Everything that is waste is food for something else. Seventy percent of our waste stream at Whole Foods Market is organic material or compostable material. Between food waste, again, try to keep that at a minimum, but that still ends up being 
a large part of the 70% that we do um, consider f waste. <coughs> um, you know, so that's food waste, that's uh, wet paper, waxed paper, plant materials, things like that. All of those things that we generate that, you know, again, uh, can either be buried in a landfill, burned in an incinerator, or go into compost. So for us, and you know, because we're an agriculturally based company, creating compost is really important. It's one of the most important things that we do. Again, <clears throat> back in 2003 when I became the Ecozar, uh, we weren't composting at all. All that stuff was going into the landfill. Um, now, I would say that the vast majority of our stores are at least diverting 70 to 80 percent of their waste stream into compost, so it's a huge amount. I, on the average, <clears throat> we're diverting about 10 tons a week of organic material per store to compost. Um, so on one hand, that's, you know, that's a really good thing from an environmental perspective because it's going to make this really highly valuable um, agricultural commodity. I'm convinced that <clears throat> a huge percentage of that material is still uh, good, you know, recoverable food. And we just haven't gotten good enough yet at, at figuring out how to do that. So what I've been talking about are the different ways that, <clears throat> pardon me, that we're trying to recover as much of that as we can. But I, I know just from looking into the composters that there's still a lot of good food that's going in there. Partly that's human nature and it's part of the pace that our business operates. So when I look into the compost uh, container, what I'll see in there is packaged food because people don't take the time to take it out of the packages. They don't feel like they have enough time to open up the clamshell and empty out the salad greens into the compost bin rather than throw the whole thing in the trash container. So as good as we are, and I think we're really good at this, there's an awful lot of food that's still ending up where it shouldn't. Yes? I was just about to ask you about that. In terms of separation of composable material from non material, like what kind of challenges have you faced in, in implementing that on the ground in the store? Yeah. And has that been an easy process or no? Um, Yes and no. So uh, the easy part is that we have so many really passionate, uh, concerned team members who come to work for us. So we're starting with a, a group of people who want to do the right thing and when we make it easy for them to do that and we help them understand the big picture of why it's important to do that, you know, the economic side, the environmental side, um, you know, the climate side of that, because uh, they're all wrapped up in that, um, they get it. <coughs> And then my, a big part of my job as the Ecozar has been to create systems that make it as easy as possible to do this. So we do things like we color code all of our sorting, bin, sorting bins. Um, we have essentially three main streams that we deal with. Uh, we have uh, organics, which is green. We have uh, recyclables, which is blue. And we have landfill, which is black or gray. So in every one of our departments, there are those three colored bins. Um, they're clearly labeled, they have signs on them that explain, and pictures whenever we can do that, that explain what goes in each bin. And we very carefully train our team members about how to do that separation. We make those bins as easy to use and easy to find as we possibly can. So in our, uh, in our kitchen areas where we do a lot of the food prep, um, we'll have a compost bin and a trash bin side by side. So a team member doesn't have to take a potato peel and walk from, you know, from here 10 feet away to put it in the right bin. It's right there with them. Um, again, color coding helps a lot. So when, when our team members see green, they know that's food. That's, that's you know, organic material. That's where it goes. Uh, when they see blue, same thing. You know, that's recyclable. Um, and the, the different languages helps a lot, you know, so we really try to make that as multilingual as we can. Uh, given all that and the fact that they are passionate people who want to do the right thing, there's still an awful lot, again, human nature. Uh, just, you know, people are in a hurry. They have a lot to do. There's a high expectation for production and, you know, so it takes a couple of extra seconds to take food out of a package and, you know, put it into two separate containers. And I wish I could say everybody was so passionate that they do the best they can every single day, but most times they do, not all the time. I, I noticed earlier that you said that they were transferring the coal between different departments to give certain incentives to those departments. Is, is there anything to incentivize like composting or um, kind of going, going to that extra effort of separating 
Not really. And uh, you know, if you can help me figure out a way to do that, I would I would appreciate it and love it. Um, you know, be, beside the uh, you know the higher value of taking care of the environment again, which people you know it does motivate our people. Um, we have a green bucks program in our stores, so people you know if a team member sees somebody doing a good job, they they can just give them a five dollar or ten dollar uh, green bucks card, which will buy them lunch or buy them dinner. So we have those kinds of you know incentives. In other aspects of our company, we have financial incentives that mean a lot to people. For example, just I'll, I'll go off course just to give you one example of that. We have what we call a labor gain sharing program. Uh, and the way that works is that each, each team gets a labor budget to take care of the work that they need to do. Uh, so every week and every month they know how much money they have to spend to pay for labor. If the team is able to get the job done and not spend all of that labor, what's left over is divided up among the team members. So it's like a bonus program that, that people know if they work efficiently, if somebody calls out sick and they don't have to call in a, an extra person, if they can manage that together as a team and still get the job done, um, then you know they get to, to keep the, uh, the difference between the labor budget and what they save. That kind of program would be great if we, if we could figure out how to do that for you know, our green mission as well. Well, it seems like that might be sort of counter kind of taking out that extra time to contemplate it and save time on top of Yeah, you're right. So, it's a conundrum. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that was quick. Um, so, you know, again, uh, if nothing else, Let's, let's kind of eliminate this idea of waste because we can't afford it. There's just, you know, there's not enough resources on the planet to have waste any longer. We need to figure out how to recategorize it, reuse it as something that can be food for something else. Um, I, you know, I apply that to um, recycling as well. Uh, you know, a, a steel can is food for another material. A plastic bottle is food for another process or another material. So. Really, there shouldn't be anything. Uh, there's very little. In fact, the uh, the uh, definition, the uh, EPA definition of zero waste means 90% of your material is being diverted. So they're allowing a 10%. Like we don't know what to do with it. There's no other solution yet. So you're allowed to have 10% waste. My my counter to that is we can't afford 10% waste. So what are we doing to you know invent or create? alternatives to those 10% uh, materials that you know can be composted can be recycled can be reused whatever it happens to be so i guess that's that's the end of my formal presentation carame i don't know how i'm doing in terms of time but now we can have q and a and justin you've got your hand up. ah that's a great question, and that's that's really 